Spider webbing, huh? Pretty cool. Uh, Spider Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, right? Uh, they do have uh, gecko gloves that could help us climb walls too. If we can manufacture the spider and spider webbing, and that bio inspiration is pretty amazing stuff. Um, nothing compares. And consider also today the everything that goes behind um, being able to see the design of the human eye or eyes or vision in general is a major and wonderful gift from God that certainly could not have evolved on its own as well. Please join me in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 12. And we will pick up looking at God through Jesus Christ. This is the study on the light of life and, <coughs> and truth. So pray with me as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your light. Thank you for the light of your truth, of reality. Thank you that you've designed us with senses to be able to explore and detect that which is true with our natural senses. You've given us spiritual sense as well to discover um, spiritual reality, being made alive when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ opening us up to all truth with the very one most highest and most important truth of who you are, God, and who we are in you. Would you please open our spirits to your spirit? Would you please open our hearts to your heart, to our eyes to your light, our ears to your voice? We pray that you please speak to us, guide us by the power of your spirit, by your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Picking up in John 8, verse 12, we're going to talk about uh, the light of life and truth and a bit of controversy that seems to always surround the idea of what truth is and knowing what truth is through Jesus Christ. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is an I, one of the I am statements, the self-claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a major claim. <coughs> he claims this statement that he is the light of the world. I want you to read this verse also sort of as an invitation. An invitation to follow him because he also tags at the end. He who follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so my daughter grabbed the flashlight this morning. I don't know where she got it from, but it was my flashlight. She grabbed it from my stuff. She took it apart, took the battery out. She said, it's not working. And well, yeah. Um, she thought the battery's dead. It's great to have a great new battery and a high lumens flashlight, isn't it? Just Careful, be careful of people's eyes and whatnot. But when it's dark, you need a light, and you need to follow close to the source of light when that's the case. And it is the case. This world is a world of darkness since the Lord Jesus has left physically. There is light, though, in following him. We need to be close to the light source when we follow him in the darkness in order to make use of his light. So, an invitation not just to follow him, but to follow him closely. Similar uh, invitations I want to draw your attention to earlier in the Gospel of John. In John 8, 12, excuse me, he had, we just read that. He invited us to follow him in order to get the light that comes from the life that is in his own non-created word of light. The reference to that being the beginning of John, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and yet the Word was God. And it says that everything that ever had a beginning was created through Him. Nothing was created or had a beginning that didn't come through Him. And it says later in that chapter that the Lord Jesus is Himself, before He became a man, the non-created, the Creator, Word that brought everything into being. And it says that in him was life. 
and the life was the light of men, of all people. Light. Light is a testimony of reality, of truth. Okay? And he is the word of life, and he is the word of light. Akin to this, in John 7, 37, he invites us to spiritually, if we're spiritually thirsty as people, to come to Jesus in order to drink of his spirit with our spirit, the deepest part of our hearts, the innermost being of your being is your spirit, the deepest part, deeper than your thoughts, your will, your emotions, your knowledge, your understanding. It's deeper than all of that. That's your spirit and to drink from his spirit because we are thirsty and lacking and hollow and empty without him, without God. Like the eye was created for light to be striking our retinas in order to process that. And our ears were created amazingly um, with to process sound through three mediums, including air, solid, and water. They're, all three elements are part of your actual ear. <clears throat> Our spirits were created to taste from the Lord and to have his light and to have his food is another description. This is in John chapter 6. John 7, 37 says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, it says. A similar invitation is in John 6, 35. It states, another statement of his identity, the Lord Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is the satisfying food and drink for our spirits. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this idea of life, life doesn't just happen. Um, and life is based on reality and light itself. Light was the very first thing that is documented that God said, let there be, and there was light, remember. And it came from the power of his word on day one. Before he created the sun or the moon or the stars. It was radiating from his own word for light. Something interesting, the word for light uh, in the Greek and the word for sound in the Greek, they both come from the same Greek word. Both light and sound come from the word theo, meaning to shine. So this idea of transmission of reality and detecting it, that's what we're talking about when we talk about light and sound and truth. That's what the Lord is talking about. We get our word for photon, for example, for light from that word. We get our word for uh, like a telephone with the, the last part phone for sound or a phonograph. Does anybody know what that is? So it just, I just think that's very interesting. Both light and sound come from this word that means to shine. Shining light and shining sound. The light that Jesus is, is an expression of the Father. Everything he commanded Jesus to speak be an expression of the eternal life for those who know and believe. Um, know and believe through Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus made this claim back to our text in verse 12. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Fullness of life, we covered a little bit of this. He is the good shepherd in John chapter 10, earlier in adult Sunday school. And he wants his sheep, his people, to be satisfied and happy in the parameters of his guardianship, of his shepherding us, and his parameters of what reality is and what makes for real life, not counterfeit life. As soon as he says this, sparked an immediate controversy. Look at verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Well, I think that's a logical fallacy. First of all, it is. 
just because someone testifies about himself or her, herself doesn't make it automatically false. This could be a reference, though, um, to the court of law, where if there's two witnesses, two or three witnesses in the court of law, the Jewish law, let everything be established on the account of two or three witnesses. Um, but that doesn't mean that him speaking, Jesus speaking of himself, makes what he says false. It's false if it's false. It's true if it's true. That's what makes it so. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. He has knowledge. He had knowledge of where he came from and where he was going. He didn't begin when he was born or when he was conceived in Mary's womb, the virgin, uh, supernaturally, with no human father, thus having no human sin inheritance. He always was, as we mentioned in John chapter 1. He knows where he came from. He came from the Father, and he knew where he was going, back to the Father. He said, by the way, to Nicodemus in chapter 3, the wind blows where it wants to, essentially. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. Those are the, what it's like to be born of the Spirit, not knowing where it comes from or where it goes. Knowing where Christ comes from, I believe, where he came from is from the Father, as he says himself, and where he went to. He went back to the Father. This is spiritual um, awakening, spiritual life, knowing who he is, where he came from, and where he went back to. I know what, even if I do testify to myself, I know who I am, and that's what <clears throat> makes my testimony true. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. They were seeing him as someone that was speaking lies, those that didn't believe in him. They thought that they had a handle of reality and that the Lord Jesus didn't. They opposed him for it. Verse 16, but he, excuse me, verse 15. You judge according to the flesh. That means to superficial appearances. You judge with just a natural understanding that doesn't have all the facts. I'm not judging anyone, but even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. So here we get to his verification of who he is. The claims that he made. The exclusive claims of Christ which he made from the beginning. He said that he is the perfect representation of the unknown and invisible Father. The fullness of the triune God dwelt bodily in him. The Father, Son, Spirit. He said if you want to hear God, you listen to what I say because I only say what he says. If you want to see him, you look at me. I only show and do what he says, or what he does, and what he shows. Verse 17, even in your law it's been written for the testimony, that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So we have the testimony of the Father confirming who Christ is. He spoke from heaven three times audibly in the scriptures that we have record. God himself, looming from the sky, from heaven, about his son. You remember what those times were? Two of them were almost exactly the same at the <coughs> baptism. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, remember? And then on the Mount of Transfiguration when the awesome, uncreated light of God shone out of him. He had it concealed and hidden on every occasion except for this occasion. And he was before three of his disciples, and he shone brighter than the sun. And the voice of the divine majesty, as Second Peter chapter 1 says, spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Listen to him. <clears throat> it's the prophetic word made more sure, as Peter called it. <clears throat> and then at right before his execution, his betrayal, arrest, execution. The Gentiles were coming to him, his disciples. They said, we're, we want to see Jesus, some, some Gentile um, seekers. They wanted to see him. They heard some things about the things that he said, the miracles that were at work through him, the things that made him unique and anointed, higher and, and above than any other human in the whole field of humanity throughout history. They wanted to see him and it provoked the Lord's 
spirit and soul to be troubled because he knew the implication in order for a seed to bear much fruit it has to drop into the ground and die and this indicated him suffering for all of our sins of all humanity of all nations every man woman and child past present and future him absorbing and becoming our sin he who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of god through faith in him the one who knew no sin. We don't understand what it's like to not know what sin is. We understand it very, very well. He didn't want to become sin, yet he did so obediently to the Father. And it was for the sake and the good and the salvation of those, in, not just in Israel who would believe in him, but of all the nations of all the earth. Truly, God's into um, an international body of believers that are united under him and in him. There's the only place where you're going to find in this world resolution, uh, resolving ethnic tension is in the church of God through Christ, those who are biblically minded in this concept. He was troubled. He said, what am I going to do? Am I going to pray that God takes this hour away from me? He said, no, but for this hour I came. This is the reason why I was born. For the whole world, the Savior of the world, for each person, each one of us. And he said, Father, instead of that, instead of praying, take it away, I'm going to pray, glorify your name. And then the Father's voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it. I have made it awesome as it is. I've made it its renown known. I have my identity revealed <coughs> to all through you, and I will do it. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Three instances of the Father testifying of him. But really, every miracle that the Lord did, um, every word that he said being the Father, an expression of the Father, the, and, and the Father working in our hearts, in people's hearts, to draw people to faith in the Good Shepherd, that's the Lord testifying, the Father testifying above the Son. In 17, he says, even in your lot, which I mentioned earlier, it's has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Oh, man, these people were just not nice. <laughs> Verse 19, so they were saying to him, where is your father? There was controversy regarding it, but the origin of Christ, uh, those who believed his virgin birth, as I mentioned earlier, no human father involved, making him unique and sinless in his humanity. Um, where's your father? They get even more nasty as we read on. But it's a, it's a slight jab. I, I'm picking up some sass here. Where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. They're thinking humanly speaking. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Perhaps they were thinking humanly speaking strictly. So they were saying to him, excuse me, verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Some phrase that's been repeated frequently through the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus, we read in John 10, nobody takes my life from me. I have to let you kill me if, if I'm going to die in any way. It's going to be my, me letting you do it. <laughs> this is a man unlike any other man. Like us, but sinless. Like us, but in control of things that none of us are in control of, like our birth, and the death, and the timing, and all that. And the method of, in, in, in fact, being crucified, according to the prophecies, rather than being stoned. It's repeated often that people wanted to put him to death to end the light that shone from him, his testimony of his word, and the miracles of his life, they wanted to end it because they disagreed with it. They wanted to censor the Lord Jesus. They wanted to cancel him. They wanted to make him go away by remo removing his life from the planet. And in cold, cold blood, but it would be in their idea, like Paul the Apostle originally, he thought that they, they thought they were doing God a service by ridding the world of a deceiver and someone who stirs up the people. But if you look at the facts... And you look at the testimony, did he deceive? 
Did he sin? Did he lie? The nature of truth in and of itself, it stands on its own, and it's detectable by those who are open to it and assessing reality for what it really is. Yes, we all need help sometimes in seeing and understanding things correctly, having a perspective added to us. Maybe we're missing. We all needed help to begin with. And it starts with the gospel being shared with us, the truth of who Christ is. This is the one truth that unlocks all truth. All truth belongs to Christ. Amen. Verse oh, 20. It says he was in the treasury, some interesting factoid of history, if you'd like. This was the, the Jewish um, Talmud, which is a Jewish, a body of Jewish civil and ceremonial law and legend. Uh, they indicated this description of the temple and the treasury is in the outer, um, the court of the women in the temple. And there stood 13 chests where there were receptacles for donations of coins and whatnot uh, in the form or the shape of trumpets. And that's where he was when this, this conversation was happening. Then he said to them again, I go, by the way, that widow who donated <coughs> the biggest donation, remember the Lord pointed her out, look, this woman's given more than anybody else. That's where that was. She gave all that she had, even though it was nothing. She gave all that compared to everybody else's gifts. Uh, Percentage-wise, and from her own heart, it was more important or more impactful that is to God's heart in seeing her giving. Then, verse twenty-one, he said again to them, "I go away; you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come." So the Jews were saying, "Surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come.'" That was their conclusion of what he meant. Kind of a stretch to jump to that whole conclusion that he's going to kill himself. But that's where they went. That's not what the Lord was teaching, of course. And he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. That's where I came from. You are of this world, just made of dirt. Separated from God, your souls, your spirits, thirsty and hungry for him. And that satisfaction, your spirits darkened. Your satisfaction for light, food and drink, as we mentioned earlier, is fulfilled by turning to me. I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. The word he is in italics. He's literally saying, unless you believe that I am. That's the name that God, of course you remember, identified himself to one Moses. Uh, in Egypt, as he was the one that has come down, hearing the cries of his people to liberate and set them free from slavery. And he was sending Moses to do it, and he wanted to tell him, I am who I am, that's my name, and I've sent, I've sent you, you can tell them that. Jesus is declaring himself to be, I am. This is the creator, again, declaring, declaring claiming divine identity. That class of being that exists nowhere else. The creator that had no beginning. There's the creator and everything else had a beginning. That's creation. God is saying who, who he is. Jesus is saying, I am who I am. Unless you believe that, then you will die in your sins. So the key to forgiveness is understanding the truth of the identity of who Christ is. And yielding to, to him and believing him. Truth is for believing so they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They, so he's staying on, on, on target, on task for what the Lord wanted, the Father wanted him to say. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he or I am, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Was it, the question is, was it the kind of faith that would endure and last? Was it a genuine faith? Verse 
31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples or students of mine, continuing in my message, my testimony, my report of reality. And it is a Christocentric reality, a reality centered on Christ, centered on the Father, centered on the Spirit, the triune God through Christ. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Knowing the truth, the truth will make you free. The truth. It's a definite article. And again, remember I mentioned, it is centered on knowing this truth about Christ first. And then all truth is open after him, connected to him. The word in the Greek is a, is a fun word for me. Uh, it's aletheia. Aletheia. And it means truth or reality, unveiled reality, lying at the basis of and agreeing with appearance. The manifested, veritable essence of matter. So truth stands on its own, I mentioned to you. It is what it is, and it's detectable. This is so cool. This idea of truth in the Greek is that you have something that is, and when you identify it, when your identification of that thing that is truth matches the reality of what it is, that's what truth is. It's sort of this double confirmation, dual confirmation of identity or truth. Something cool. If I, and some kids like this, if I put a mystery bag together and I put something in the bag and I ask you to stick your hand in there and feel for what it is. Have you seen these things on TV where they maybe do perfect, they feel for what kind of animal might be in a box and they have to guess what kind of animal Maybe it's a snake, maybe it's, maybe it's worms, maybe it's maggots, whatever it is. They have to guess what it is based on tactile feedback. Uh, I did that with my daughter. Uh, not with maggots or snakes, but <laughs> scorpions, snakes. No, here's a, here's a rock, kid, eat that. No, that's not a good father. Lord said so. Uh, I put an orange in it, and I asked her to reach in there and feel for what it was. So... The reality of truth is that that orange is, whether you detect it or not. When she goes in with her sense of tactile, sense, sensory uh, neurons, she feels the shape and the squishiness of it, and she verifies that what it, her experience is in that fruit in the past. She identifies, based on touch, that that is an orange. Her idea of what it is in her mind matches the reality of what it actually is in the bag. And she used a sense to do it. God, God gave her that ability. That's the word for truth. It's this, it's this two, -sided, two sides of the same coin. What it is and your understanding of what it is matching the reality of what it is. It's so cool. That's who the Lord is. And he said, if you continue my word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. Freedom is not to do whatever I want. Freedom is to be everything that God wants me to be according to what his design is and his word is. And this idea is the word for freedom in the Greek here. It speaks of being unrestricted. <laughs> in other words, um, you, for example, you could like tie... Um, a 500 pound weight around my leg and say, now you have been restricted, you cannot fly. Well, I was, that's really not a restriction because I'd never had that capacity to fly to begin with, right? But if you put me in a straight jacket, now my, my range of motion is limited based on what its full range of motion once was. Now I have been restricted, now I'm not free. So freedom is based on design, based on God's design. It's based on reality. So, being free is connected to knowing the truth of who Christ is. Continuing in the message of who he is. I had big ambitions to read much more. Um, but, be that as it may, um, We've covered some good things. Uh, the <clears throat> response, the answer, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. 
and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. So dramatic, right? Such, but how can that even be thought to be true by anyone with any knowledge of their own history, right? How can someone think that they've never been enslaved, being a Jewish person versed in history, okay? Babylonian captivity, you've got the Assyrian captivity for those tribes in the north, you've got... Um, the Egyptian captivity. Oh, and by the way, right then and there, they're in the occupation of the Roman Empire, right? <laughs> We've never been, oh, come on. So again, that's the kind of idea that reality is, truth is, but whether someone acknowledges it or not, but they're, they're making this claim. We're not, we've never been enslaved. How can you say we'll be free? Like it's like something we don't have, <clears throat> says the person in a straight jacket. I'm free, I'm as free as I wanna be. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The sin is the slave driver in all of our lives. And he says the slave does not remain in the house forever. If you cross-reference this with Hebrews chapter 3, um, speaking of Moses and the Lord, the Lord uh, is speaking to the writer of Hebrew that Moses was a faithful slave in all of God's house. In contrast, the Son of God was a faithful son, higher level of prominence and identity. Much better to be a son than a slave in a house, right? The Son of God is this, this freedom of identity and range of motion based on his identity, being the Son, the one and only Son of God, the perfect expression of the Father. The one who has the life of the Father in him, outliving through him. He said so much that you can see me and see the Father and hear the Father in me. That gift, that, that, that precious relationship between Father and Son, He gifts to us. He gives to us through faith in Him and makes us no longer slaves but sons. He's calling these people who claim to think that they're, they're free, but they're not, and to look and set their sights higher on what real freedom is. In truth, in reality, in Christ, in who He is. In order to have a long-lasting place in the house of God, is what he's saying. Slaves don't have that. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. You're not being reasonable based on my word of truth and life. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard with your father. Again, back to the father concept. And we'll close in just a moment. So they made a dig at him a little bit about his uh, origin, and we'll see that uh, it was really what they're getting at is saying that he's an illegitimate child. Um, they didn't, they didn't uh, indicating somehow or another that Mary was unfaithful to her fiance when she got pregnant. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father, Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Like father, like son, right? You don't look like your dad. <coughs> That's your dad, physically. It's, he's not your dad spiritually. It's, it's a big difference. It's like the, the ugly duckling, right? <laughs> Something's not the same here. Do the deeds of your father, Abraham. What does he mean? But as it is, you are seeking to kill me. A man who has told you, the truth. You're resistant to the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham, he didn't do this. This Abraham did not do. Go check the book. He didn't try to murder people to speak in the truth. Did they hear this? You are doing the deeds of your father. They said, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And there it is, their nasty accusation and slander. <clears throat> and even if that was the case, which it isn't, because he would be sinful if that was the case, but if, like a random person who's not claiming to be God or the Savior or sinless, if he was born by some immoral sexual relationship, how is that that person's fault? How does that make that person any less of a person in God's image or loved by God? It's just a logical fallacy, ad hominem, attack the man to discredit his message, which is really... It's a distraction. It doesn't really address anything. It 
It's irrelevant. Jesus, they claim to be God's kids. <laughs> They're talking trash to God's one and only son. Or we are God's kids. Who do you think you are? Oh my goodness, you can think of worse words that they could have called them in our normal language, modern language, but that's what they were doing. And Jesus said, And if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came for, have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth, because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So this is really the heart of what constitutes sin. Um, it's lies, contrary to truth. Look at what he says as we read on. We'll close here in just a moment. He says, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Calling truth lies and lies truth. He who is of God, excuse me, verse 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? And he could claim this all the time, sinless one. In contrast to being convicted of sin, look what he says. This is what the, the sort of the key component that defines what constitutes actual sin. He said, if I speak truth, why do you not believe me? So which one of you convicts me of sin? You can't. I'm speaking the truth. So if I'm speaking something wrong, testify the wrong. He who is of God or from God hears the words of God. For this reason, you cannot hear them. You do not hear them because you are not of God, not from God. And we got to skip down a little bit further. They slander him some more. They call him demon possessed. They get out of a racial slur against him. They're saying you're a Samaritan. You've got a demon. You know that their arguments dry when they go to name calling, right? <laughs> Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. You dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There's one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died. And the prophets also. You say if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, build up here, dramatic build up. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he's our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I'll be a liar like you. <laughs> So you say you know God, you're a liar. If I was to say I don't know him, that would make me a liar from Jesus' perspective because he does know him uniquely. They didn't. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Remember he said I'm the light of the world? He is the sunlight of the world. His coming, his advent, and we're waiting for his return, the sunrise return of Christ. He saw it and was glad. He's indicating knowledge of things that transpired before his birth. His birth was not his beginning. His conception was not his beginning. Jesus said to the Jews said to them, him, you are not yet 50 years old. How do you, how, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Again, the I am bomb <laughs> that he drops on them. Because it's the truth. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. <clears throat> Homework, read the next chapter. Because <laughs> it continues from here to the next, and study the concept of light and God opening eyes of a blind man. And, and just imagine being that kind of a person that you know, don't know what light is. You know that you're missing something major in life because you're blind, and other people apparently get to detect certain things that you don't understand, like light and seeing things. You know that, if you're missing something, but you don't know what, and then Jesus healed his eyes, and gave him vision, spiritual and physical, and you see the controversy play out some more based on that man. And uh, pray with me, and we, we, uh, we will close. Lord, you are the one that was sent by the Father. You are the perfect image of the Father in human form. You are 
<clears throat> I am. You're the creator. You are the light of the world. You are the bread of life. You are the one that we come to for thirst, to be satisfied in our own spirits, life-giving water. And you are the author of reality. You are the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Life is based on truth. And I pray that you would please just unite our own hearts to be yielded to you by faith in you, identifying the truth of who you are. The truth does stand on its own, truly. In all circumstances and situations, we are like that blind man, susceptible to missing out and not understanding what we don't know, even. But you're the one that opens eyes. You are the one that is the light of the world. And you are the one that came to restore that which was lost. The, the broken, even the physically broken senses of humanity, like a blind man or a lame man, you came to restore fullness of life where the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. There are really two families in the world. We pray that you please give us success, drawing closer to you, but success in inviting other people to follow you, to know the critical truth of you, and then unlocking truth and freedom and life for each person, we pray. Give us success, Lord, please. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We trust you for that. And amen. <clears throat> it's almost like you left us on a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so Got to have a come back next week and uh, finish it. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate you coming. All right, let's all stand and we'll turn to hymn number seventy-four. <laughs> hymn number seventy-four. Thank you so much for Jesus. <clears throat> we thank you for this message this morning, dear. I'll talk to Jesus. His deity, identity. And that's what we need to tell people all around us. How much your son died for each and every one of us. We know that your word also speaks of hell. And uh, we know sometimes it's not the easiest thing to cover. But we do need to do what you want us to do. Go you there for me to go and preach the gospel to every creature. I pray that you give us strength to be able to do that. We, that we be good soldiers for you. I pray that you give us safety and easy back to our homes. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Mm -hmm.